providing chicken. If Brother Lopez was here, he would say amen. Uh, sign up sheet for dinner. If you want to bring anything else, is on the board in the back, and you can sign up and bring whatever you'd like. Something maybe sweet. Some dessert would be awesome. Um, Luke 17, 11, speaking of Jesus, it says, And it came to pass when, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he, as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten lepers, ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Verse number 14, And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, only one, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. In other words, he was a nobody in that culture. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? In verse number 18, there are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger, a nobody. Verse number 19, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. You see, nine of them got cleansed from leprosy. Leprosy was a degenerative disease that would slowly eat away at your body. And, and they were cleansed from the leprosy, but they still had parts missing. They still had limbs missing. They might have had their nose missing. Fingers were still gone. They were cleansed. But now there was one that said, you know what? I have been cleansed. I need to turn to the one that did this to me, and I need to give him glory. And that one, all of a sudden, the limb began to grow back. The nose began to grow back. He was made perfectly whole. This is what he said in our terms today. Jesus, if you never do anything else for me, I'm going to give you glory for what you've already done. If he's never done anything else, if you never do one single thing for me, I'm going to give you glory because you cleansed me. You put me in my right mind. You cleansed me. You washed me. You sanctified me. I'm cleansed. I'm whole. God, I thank you. I worship you. And today, I want to tell somebody, Psalms 150 says this, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him. Come on, it's a little quiet right now. And According to his excellent greatness. Come on, somebody. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and heart. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with the string instrument. Come on, somebody. Is anyone thankful? Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. We used to sing a song that said, Praise him. Praise him. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him. Praise him when the sun goes down. I want to tell somebody, it doesn't matter your condition right now. If you come in, it, it, you, you're still missing a part of you today. It, there's a blessing if you turn back to the one that forgave your soul and just start praising him. You'll find your broken heart can be mended. You'll find the peace of mind that you lost can be restored. You'll find relationships can be healed. You'll find that something that was missing in your life that you never felt before, you can have that. You can have the embracing love of a father. Come on, somebody. Last time I checked, the Bible says, I will restore the year of the canker worm. There's a restoration in this house today, but will you turn back? Come on, it's a little quiet right now. Will you turn back and praise him for what he's already done? Let's lift up our hands right now. God, I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Jesus. God, I want to thank you for everything you've done in my life. God, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. God, I was a wretch. I was undone. I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't even walk without you holding my hand. But God, you stepped in and you cleansed me. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship him in this place. Will the mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace is He, the everlasting Father, the King eternally, wonderful in wisdom, by whom all things are made, the fullness of the Godhead, Jesus is displayed, yes, and it's all all in Him, the fullness of the Godhead. It's all in Him. Well, it's all in Him. It's all in Him. Mighty God is Jesus. It's all in Him. This Emmanuel, God with us, 
Jehovah, Lord of hosts, that omnipresent spirit that fills the universe. The advocate, the high priest, the lamb for sinners slain, the author of redemption, oh glory to his name. Yes, and it's all in him. It's all in The Godhead is all in Him. Well, it's all in Him. Yes, it's all in Him. That mighty God is Jesus. All in Him. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. The living Word incarnate, the helpless sinner's friend. Our wisdom and perfection, our righteousness and power. It's all we need of Jesus, and we find this very hour that it's all, all in Him. Yeah. It's all in Him. The fullness of the, the Godhead. Godhead. It's all. For whom we've waited will be our glad refrain of Israel created. When Jesus comes again, He will come and save us, our King and Priest to be. For in Him dwells all fullness, the Lord of all is He. Yes, it's all in Him. It's all. In the Godhead, it's all in Him, yes, it's all in Him, it's all in Him, the mighty God is Jesus, and it's all in Him, well, it's all in Him, it's all in Him, the fullness of the Godhead, it's all a difference between just singing that it's all in him and knowing that it's all in him Amen. and as I look around this congregation I see some people that's tried some other things that you tried to find some peace that wasn't in him but then you found Jesus and you can testify to somebody else and say I don't care what yes. you need it's all in Jesus this morning church why don't we act like it's all in him as we come to this house it's not in the bar. It's not in the drugs. It's not in the things of this world. It's all in Him. Jesus, God, I love you. I came up here to take up an offering. I'm going to ask our ushers to come. And as we give, let's give unto the kingdom, but also let's give of ourself, and let's give ourselves some worship and praise for the remainder of this service. Jesus, Lord, we love you. God, we're thankful for this opportunity given to your kingdom. Bless this, Lord. Let it go for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Lord, I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Supply all my needs, he is my answer to die. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh, he is my God. My God is more than enough. He can supply all my needs. He is my answer to die. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh, he is my God. 
Supply all my needs, he is my El Shaddai, he always looks out for me, Jehovah Jireh, he is my God. My God is more than enough, he can supply all my needs, he is my El Shaddai, he always looks out for me, Jehovah Jireh, he is my God. All of the earth is his, and the fullness thereof, everything Jehovah Jireh, He is my God. All of the earth is His. All of the earth is His, and the fullness thereof. Everything that I need, You can be sure of. Jehovah Jireh, He is my God. So why should I worry about the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs? Well, when by my faith I know my God is more than enough. He can supply. Jehovah Jireh, he is, he is my God. So why should I worry about the highs and the lows? Ups and the downs. Well, with all my faith, I know my God is more than enough. He can supply all my needs. He is my El Shaddai. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh, he is, he is my God. Shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise, shout with the voice of triumph, shout with the voice of praise, shout unto God for the victory, hey, hey, hey give the Lord a shout of praise, shout with the voice of triumph, I'm gonna shout with the voice of praise, shout with the voice of triumph. Shout with the voice of praise. Shout unto God for the victory. Hey, 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 give the Lord a shout of praise. Shout with the victory. Shout you've been set free. So. Shout with the victory. Shout you've been set free. So. Shout for the victory, shout we've been set free, shout. Shout for the victory, shout we've been set free, shout. Shout for the victory, shout we've been set free, shout. Shout for the victory, shout we've been set free, shout. Shout for the victory, shout we've been set free, shout. Shout for the victory, shout we've been set free, shout. Lord, you're mighty. 
I just feel impressed to tell somebody that's waiting on the next big thing, the next great revival, the next, and then you're waiting on just the time you come in and everything feels right from the beginning of the service to the end, and that's when you get your miracle. That's when you get the Holy Ghost. That's when, let me tell you, that tomorrow is a lie. Man, and it, it's, it's, it will rob you of what God wants to do today. Man, it doesn't matter if you came in just feeling off. You just drug in here tired and weary. Man, I believe God can change all of that in the middle of a prayer session, in the middle of a worship song, in the middle of an altar call. Man, and you may have come in here just going to make it through the service. That's the, I mean, I know I'm not the only one that's came in with that game plan today. I'm just going to make it to Sunday afternoon. That's what we're gunning for. Now, how about, how about you make today the day that you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Come on, today can be the day marked on your calendar that five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now, you're saying that was the day it all changed for me. That was the day I got what I needed in God. That, that was the day I was baptized in Jesus' name. That was the day I was healed and delivered and that was the day I laid my addiction down at the altar. Never picked it up again. Now, we, we, we all shout about it. We get excited about it. But, but doing it's a little harder. So I just, again, I just want to encourage us on the reality of it. Man, we're, we're about to hear some great preaching. We're about to, man, and, and, and we're going to have to ignore what's on our to-do list. We're going to have to ignore even how we feel to some degree, what our body is telling us. And we're going to have to put God first. If this is our day, I'm talking to some saints of God too. This can be the day that, that the depression is lifted. This can be the day that your focus gets right again. But it starts with some effort. God will... So often, he, he can do anything, but there is a principle we see that it, he will do what we can't, but so often he won't do what we can. We have to be willing to do what we can. And maybe, maybe your health won't even hardly let you come to the altar, but if you will raise your hands and pray, man, and if you'll get our attention, somebody will come pray with you. Man, somebody can get the Holy Ghost in their pew today. But, but somebody can come up here and just be set free and, and think clearly and leave feeling lighter than they came in the door. God wants to do some things for us, in us, through us today. But I also want to do some things for Him. And all of that requires our effort and our focus. So you can make your way to your seats, but just remain standing. Thank you for worshiping. And thank you for being a worshiping church. We're a blessed people. We really are. Now, um, we are we're going to pray just for a moment over those that are sick. We do have quite a few that are unable to be here that are sick today. And uh, we want to uh, lift them up in prayer. Thank you, brother. And uh, you can just kind of look next to you and see who's missing. And, uh, and no, we won't make mention of all of them, but we do want to... To, I, I don't think she'll mind. We do want to have special prayer for Sister Kim Rucker and just that God would touch her body. And, uh, man, we, we sometimes battle with things for for years. And, uh, man, I, I, the, again, if you got God figured out, you are God because only, only He knows all those answers. But, but I do know what the Scripture says about prayer. And I do know that God honors our prayers. And, man, we can pray for an instant healing. And God can do that in a moment. But whether he chooses to or not, he honors the fact that we're praying in faith. And so we're going to pray a divine touch on her today. And if you've got a, a need you want to make mention of, if you'll just represent it. And, and we're, going to, we're going to pray today in faith. Man, we don't have to pray 
out of habit. We can pray out of faith today, knowing our God hears, our God answers. Amen. Let's pray right now. Lord, we love you. We are so thankful, my God, that you're here in this place, that you're attentive to our cry even now. Lord, I pray your touch, my God, over every need represented by the raising of the hand. My God, you know those needs. You know the individual. My God, I pray that you would honor that faith right now. My Lord, we're honoring you in obedience to pray, my God, in faith, trusting, Lord, that you're going to work, that you're going to move. I pray for encouragement and strength on those that need it. I pray, Lord, you touch on Sister Kim, Lord, right now, that you would touch her in her body, that you would touch her, Lord, with healing, that you would touch her with relief, my Lord. I pray over all those that are sick and unable to be here, God, you would strengthen them, those that are traveling for work right now, that you strengthen them where they are as they listen to the live stream, Lord. They know that there's a church that's praying for them and a God that loves them and they're not forgotten, although they're not here. Lord, and I pray now, God, over the remainder of this service, Lord, that you would help us get in tune with you, Lord, that you would speak to us, my God, and that we would receive and hear and obey, my God. To you be all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. We love you. We thank you. Come on, why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for answering. Thank you for hearing, my God. You're faithful. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's so good to have the Kilmans with us. Brother and Sister Kilman, we love them. And uh, amen. If you were here yesterday, you were blessed by their ministry. And, uh, and, and I'll say this, uh, man, it's good to have them as special guests with us. But if you're a guest with us, uh, whether I've got to meet you yet or not, we are so thankful that you're here. Why don't we give all our guests a hand clap? We are you. Also, uh, our, yesterday was our Apostolic Identity Conference, and uh, is our first one, but it's going to be something that we uh, we try to get in the habit of doing at least annually. So if you weren't able to make it yesterday, I encourage you, please, please, in, through your week, when you get the time, if it's on your way to work, listen to the teachings on the live stream. Um, on the church's Facebook page or like to be put on the YouTube page um, uh, of the teaching yesterday. I mean, that is vital for the day and the hour that we're living in. And, uh, and also, we tend to be kind of taken back by something that we're not used to. And we had these classes on a Saturday, and I realized there were many that were maybe unsure what it was all about. Uh, but this will let you know that next time you want to be there. So, uh, so you might want to watch that, and I would encourage you to. Uh, but right now, we're going to be blessed by his live and in-person ministry. And, uh, uh, man, I, I give a lot of honor to Brother Kilman as he comes. But Sister Kilman is such a blessing to, to so many. And just having them, amen, having them in our home yesterday, they, they didn't stop ministering just because they were off the clock, so to speak. They were ministering to my wife and I and just uh, wonderful people. You know, your ministry is just an overflow of who you are. It really is. You can't just try to be a, a great minister up here and then be someone else off the clock. It doesn't really, the anointing flows from the real you, not the fake you. And, uh, and they are very real and very anointed. Uh, Brother Kilman, why don't you come minister to us? Let's give my hand clap as well. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. As you're turning in your Bibles to John chapter 5, let me hand out some flowers verbally while you do that. Your pastor and his sweet wife are so kind. The, the family is great. I got serenaded with a guitar and a cowboy hat. Was it Bishop? No, it wasn't the pastor. <laughs> they were so kind. And uh, man, you know, the gift basket was great. And then, you know, some home cooking was amazing. And uh, I, I still have cupcakes to take home. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Your hospitality has been amazing. I want to applaud you. I know that not everyone can make events like yesterday. But those of you who were there, thank you for your openness, your attentiveness. And... Uh, there, there's a, a passage, and I'll try not to get stuck here, but in John chapter 5, 6, and 7, that great Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus laces a little comment in there, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And that promise, it's, uh, I'll throw a little language at you this morning. It's in the accusative, or usually in the uh, genitive, a part. It's kind of like saying, I want a piece of chocolate cake. Uh, but that uh, chocolate caramel cake my wife makes, it's, you know, it's so good uh, that it's like Jesus says, it, you know, it's in the accusative, I want all the cake. I don't want a piece of the cake. I want the whole thing. And that's what Jesus is saying. You can translate that from the Greek. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after the all of righteousness. And it's emphatic in the Greek. They and they alone shall be filled. Turn to your neighbor say, do you want it all? Amen. Amen. John chapter 5 verse 39 and 40 reads like this. Jesus saying to some very religious people in his day he says search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me then Jesus warns them because they they've been misreading the Bible and they have missed him and ye will not come to me that ye might have life I, I'm going to maybe preach or treat or do something in between. Uh, I, I want to talk about misreading Revelation. We're going to get to someplace good, but I, I just want to deliver something from my heart and ask the Lord to help us. Would you slip up your hand? Thank you for your worship. But slip up your hand one more time and, and throw away the shovel and don't think that this is for somebody else, but get a rake and just say, Lord, bring this all to me. I want you to speak to me today, God. I, I come to your house, Lord. We want to hear from your word, Lord. We pray somehow by your spirit you would help us in our weakness, Lord. We want to give our heart to your people. We pray that you would open understanding so somebody can walk in faith and somebody can take steps of obedience so that they can receive what only you can give. And we'll be careful to thank you and give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you. you may be seated. Wow. Didn't, uh, didn't that worship team do good? Amen. People get here way before we do, and they practice, and they make things happen, and I get to go pray by myself. I don't have to worry about anybody else getting schedules and all that, and I want to give them thanks for that. And People are over there serving children and all over the church. It takes a whole body to do that, so I give honor to everyone that was a part of setting up yesterday and even today as we just get to come in and enjoy this service. It takes a team. I, I do want to I do want to try to uh, just get what the Lord, I think, wants me to get into your heart. He's doing something really interesting in this passage. Jesus is doing something that's countercultural today. Uh, it's something that we're at times uncomfortable with saying ourselves. When we look at somebody that's coming to us with a religious expression, they have the Bible, they have the scriptures, Jesus says. You, you've been reading these uh, verses all of your life, and he says, in them ye think ye have eternal life. And there are good people that the Lord is going to put into your path that think that they're saved. They think that they're on the road to heaven. And the question is, are they willing to hear the words of Jesus? I will tell you this is what uh, I might call the dangers of crown Christianity. It's growing up in a church somewhere like I did. You know, I cut my teeth on the pew, as they would say. And I, I grew up in church dodging high heels and hairpins as people were shouting in the aisle. But at some point, I had to own my own faith. I had to say, do I believe this because my mother and father believe this? Do I believe this because my six siblings believe this? Or do I believe this for myself? Can I come to a step of faith for my, myself? And I know this is going to be a tough, little bit of a tough sermon, but I gotta, I gotta do it. It reminds me of little Joel when my wife would take him around, and and Mama's love language is gift giving, so she's always coming home is a lot of times with the prize. And so that little boy learned Mama's love language, and they walk go into Walmart, and she's got him in the little buggy, and he's like, "Mama, can I have a prize? Can I have a prize? Mama, can I have a prize?" She said, "No, buddy, I I can't get you a prize. Mama, please, you never get me a prize." And you know the, how children are. 
She said, I got you a prize the last time. And she said, please, Mama, I want a prize. And, and so that Mama has to educate that l- uh, little boy who's now 23. And she looks at him and she says in that little cart, now listen, Mama can't get you a prize every time we go to Walmart. First of all, Mama can't afford that. And second of all, if Mama did, it'd make you a jerk. And I would be a bad mommy. Little boy's sitting there with his arms crossed, and they go down the aisle a little bit, and he just kind of mumbles under his breath, sometimes I wish I had me a bad mommy. <laughs> now, I understand we want everything to be nice, and we want everything to be cordial, and you don't want a bad preacher. You don't. Every once in a while, we got to say, we got to get permission for the Lord to kind of get in our face a little bit and say, I, I understand you would like some things in life, but there's some things I want to give you. I want to get you to a good place, but every once in a while, I got to just be what maybe you think is going to say something bad. Maybe it's a bad sermon. Maybe it's a bad preacher up there. I'm just going to tell you, not every road leads to Jesus. And we got to let the Lord address issues in our lives so that we can, we can understand that we can be, we can read the Bible our entire life. And if we're not careful, miss him. So it, it, I'm going to throw some terms at you. Turn to your neighbor and say, they're just terms. So it's, uh, there's a term. It's called epistemology. What does that mean? It means uh, the study of how we acquire knowledge. How do you know what you know about God? And how do you get where you get to about God? And, and the way we do church is informed by the Bible. And we unapologetically are going to say, if it's not in the Bible, I don't want anything to do with it. If it's not in the pattern that God gave me, I guess I don't need it, Pastor, because at the end of the day, I'm not trying to please man. I'm trying to please God. I, I'm not trying to uh, line my life up with, to make everybody agree with me. I want to line my life up so that heaven is on my side and so that the blessings of the Lord can flow into my life. Now I know I'm being strong. I'm trying to behave because I don't want to be offensive. But every once in a while you got to know that just you standing for truth will, will offset some people. And so how do you know? How, how do you say some things? Oh, so epistemology, what do I know about God? It's about how, another word, turn to your neighbor and say, it's just another word. It's called hermeneutics. And that's what Jesus is talking about in this passage. Hermeneutics is how to read and interpret the Bible correctly. And that means you can misread the Bible. If you got on a lens of tradition instead of a lens of revelation, you can misunderstand what God wants you to see. That's what Jesus is saying in his day. I understand you're experts. You're experts in the law. And, and you know, try not to be too smart. Hey, lucky here, but you're little experts and you run around. You got your scholarship and you got all the people that agree with you. The challenge at the end of the day is would the sermon that's being preached in your church be recognized by Jesus and the apostles? I'll go a step further. If you go to your baptismal ceremony in your church, doesn't match anything that the apostles would recognize. If you could pull Peter out of history and drop him in the middle of your baptism ceremony, the question is, would he recognize what you're doing? All due respect to my Catholic friends. He, they don't sprinkle in the New Testament. All due respect to my Baptist friends. They don't baptize in the titles in the Bible. They baptize in the only saving name, which is the name of Jesus. What well, are you saying, Brother Kilman? You're doing church wrong. You're doing church wrong because you're not doing it according to the pattern. And so, uh, have you ever been reading the Bible? And I'm sure many of you, I'm, I'm going to challenge some of you to uh, commit some things to memory today that will help you share your faith. And, and, and I, I expect the Lord to use you. I expect the Lord to put hungry people that are trapped in tradition in front of you. Now, I'm going to be really strong today. I'm going to be as strong as Jesus. All right, now what does that mean, Brother Kilman? It means, means something like this, that there can be people, and I know you got a jail ministry here at the church, and you go and you talk to people about coming out of the lifestyle. How many of you know the Lord can do what he did for my daddy? He can take that old backslidden boy, and he can take him out of alcoholism. He can baptize him in Jesus' name in 1968 and watch him be healed of cancer in the water. How many of you know the Lord can deliver you from addiction, and he can make you a better man and a husband and a father than you could ever be on your own. But he also has to deliver people from tradition. 
There's two ways to be lost. Irreligious and religious. And we have to be careful to say that I want to make sure that when I get on the other side of, of this thing and I step into eternity, when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't want him to look at me and say, you have been reading the Bible wrong your whole life. He says, you remember that crazy old Hoosier that the pastor had to come in and preach to you and talk to you about making sure that you understand my revelation? Everybody's going to have a witness somewhere that there is only one God and his name is Jesus. And if you want to walk with him, you got to lay aside every tradition that would stop you from embracing who he is turn to your neighbor and say he needs to calm down see I love this thing I, I, I know because it's like there is a reality that uh, people need to understand that you can be lost right in a church house that you can be locked away from the potential of what God wants to do in your life by the lies of tradition. And it's man-made stuff. And I don't even think it's malicious all the time. It's just people that are raised a certain way. And I, I, I'll i try to hurry today. So when people, it's like a, my, my, my mentor in, in IBC when I was in Bible college, Brother Talmadge French, he was a raised church of God. He was an assembly of God ordained minister when the Lord brought revelation uh, to him and and, and when he got the revelation of the mighty God in Christ and the revelation of baptism in Jesus' name, he, he went on to a seminary, began to ch- uh, do some things that the Lord directed him, much like uh, the path he put me on, uh, Brother Hawkins, uh, Hawkins Smith. And he said, here's the issue. When you get there, the, the, the professor, he said, now, you tell me that there are things that I need to believe in in order to be a Christian. Certain doctrines that if I don't confess, I'm a heretic and that I'm not saved. He said, now, when I, when I look at the Bible, and especially the New Testament, and you told me, look in the New Testament because you can't find it in the Old Testament. I've looked in the New Testament. You say, study the Gospel of John. I've looked at the Gospel of John. And he said, and you said, well, you need to read it in Greek. He said, well, I'm an ancient language major. And I've read it in the Greek. I've read it in the English. I've read it upside down. No, he didn't say upside down. But he said, I've read it every way that I can, and I can't find the concept of the Trinity in the Bible. And the seminary professor looked at him and said, of No, of course not. He said, what you need to understand, Talmadge, is that we've gone beyond the Bible. And that's the question I have for you today. Are you willing to go beyond the boundaries of God's revelation? There's some things I can't say about God because my hands are tied by revelation. I don't think I'm smarter than God today. I can only preach what's in the Bible. I can only say what's in the Bible. I can only confess what the Lord has said about himself because he is self-defined. He said, that's right, you've gone beyond the Bible. He says, he says uh, well, what you need to know is the Bible says that they were ignorant and unlearned fishermen. Now, what that meant was they were not, they, they were not trained by the, in the rabbinical schools of the day. They didn't go to Rabbi Shammai or Rabbi Hillel they were, or even Gamaliel, taught by where Apostle Paul was. And, and, and he says you, they didn't have any of that background. That's all that means. But, but he, that doesn't mean that they were stupid. They may have had a good teacher, a good rabbi. His name was Jesus. And he says, now you're not saying that they were stupid. He said, that's exactly it. They were too stupid to get it. You had to wait till these great Greek philosophers and thinkers came along in the 2nd and 3rd and 4th century. And then they could explain God. He said, well, I tell you what, you can stay with them and I'll stay with the guys who can say silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And the lame man gets up and goes into the temple praising God. I'll try to zero in. Our our wonderful friends use the Bible. They use the scripture. But they also use other things. They use the... uh, uh, They use... Second to fourth century philosophy, things that were developed in creeds and councils. Everybody say after the New Testament. (laughs) Now, I'm just going to tell you, I mean... There's a genesis and there's a revelation, and that's bookends. There's a beginning and there's an end. And we're called to earnestly contend for the faith that was once, not many times, delivered unto the saints. I'm going to throw a little Greek at you again. It's emphatic in the Greek. It's once and for all. 
Nobody can take me down the road of tradition away from God's revelation. And all due respect to our friends, they would say, uh, Brother Kilman, what does that look like? I mean, we, we could talk about it. I'll try not to get stuck here, Bishop, but it's like... Uh, you know, they, they develop these philosophies about God over time and, 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 and through uh, the councils uh, like Council of Nicaea, which was important in terms of developing the doctrine of the Trinity, 325 A.D. But, but that, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity as understood today wasn't fully developed until 381 at the Council of Constantinople. And if you, depending on when you date the, the writing of the book of Revelation, somewhere between 80, uh, 70 rather, and 90 AD, that's almost 300 years after the close of Scripture. Are you telling me I couldn't understand or confess who God was until 300 years after the Bible has already been written? I'm going to tell you that's not the way uh, that we need to understand the will of God and the word of God and the revelation of God. God's not willing that any would perish. He wants you to have the steps you need to understand who he is so that you can understand that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, I, I'll try to, I'll try to, okay. So what do, you, what do you mean, Brother Kilman? Here's what, what apostolics would say. We believe that God's process of revelation is good. So here's what I'd like you to do. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll slow down just a little bit. Open your Bible. If you've got a physical Bible, separate off the Old Testament. Like this. Now, I know some of you got some nice study Bibles out there. I saw some nice study Bibles. If you've got a nice study Bible, you can separate off the concordance. I've got a little bitty study concordance on this one. So you can separate that off and then get the Old Testament and the New Testament up and hold it up. Now, I know it's hard to tell. It's so difficult to see which is bigger. Which is bigger? Old Testament. Why? Because the Bible says the Apostle Paul writing in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. And that means that Jesus could only come with the proper context of revelation first. The law, Paul says in Galatians 3.24, is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Why, why is the law our schoolmaster? Because the law teaches me things. It teaches me that humanity fail in Genesis 3. It teaches me that I have a fallen nature. It teaches me that I can't keep the law in my flesh, so i got to go to the tabernacle or the temple, and something's got to die so that I can live. So when John says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, you got 75% of the revelation of God as a foundation because if Jesus doesn't die in our stead as the Lamb of God, we cannot be saved. That's why neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Why? Because he's the only man that died. He's the only man that lived perfectly. He's the only spotless lamb that can be applied in his blood to my life. I'll, I'll, I'll try to hurry. Man, I want to say so much today. What, what I'm saying is something like this. That's our lens when we read. Uh, passages in the New Testament like the prayers of Jesus or the baptism of Jesus or all sorts of other things where Jesus is praying in the garden, not my will. All of those have to be understood from an Old Testament perspective. And that means that we believe that we don't need extra biblical revelation. We don't take, uh, we take this to interpret this. We don't go outside of this almost 300 years to find something to explain this. God gave us this. Let every man be a liar and let God be true. Can I just tell you, you don't need, you just need to look people in the eye and say, I understand that you believe differently than I do, but all I need for revelation is right here. All I need for salvation is right here in his book. We got so many admissions today. I could tell you example after example after example, but I'll just give you one. His name's uh, Luke Timothy Johnson. He's a Catholic scholar. Anybody got any Catholic friends? I got some Catholic friends. I'm trying to win everybody. Hallelujah. I got some, I got all sorts of friends. I got Eastern Orthodox friends, Mother Catherine. I got uh, quite a few friends I'm trying to win for Jesus. 
And we go talk about, we talk about the Bible and how they view the Bible and read the Bible. And Luke Timothy Johnson's a, the, one of the premier Catholic scholars. And this is what he says in one of his teaching videos for the Teaching Institute. He says, we do not have a New Testament view of God. <laughs> he, says, he says, the Apostle Paul knows nothing about the third person of the Trinity. He says that when you're filled with the Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit of Christ. That it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here's what he says. We say as Catholics, and by the way, most of you Trinitarian Protestants would say that when you're filled with the Spirit, you have the third person of the Trinity. Third. He says, Paul says you got the second. Now the problem with that is Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 4, as one God and Father of all, who's above all, through all, and... I'm getting confused. Is it the first, the second, or the third? It's getting kind of crowded. Especially when he goes to say, on to say in Ephesians 4, there's only one spirit. And if there's only one spirit, you either get the one God in multiple aspects of the way that he wants to save you, what he intended as father, what he purchased as a son, and what he applies by his spirit, or you got some kind of confusing thing that, that makes the Bible contradict itself. Okay, I'll try to hurry. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's going to try to hurry. Now, what I'm doing, I know I'm being crazy because I love this. But what you need to understand is the way that you read the Bible is critical. So God is, and I mean this with love. There are people that love Jesus. There are people that are hungry right now saying, God, I want more of you. And you're going to be on the job next to them. And you cannot be intimidated by tradition. You have to be willing to share out of your heart the truth, the things that you know about the Lord. Amen. So I'm going to give you a little equation to write on a little napkin on your lunch break or, or, or that you can write on, a, on the, like I worked in construction, walk over, just do it in the dust. It'll be great. Write 2-4. So this is the way most people read the Bible. Most traditions in, in this, this town read the Bible this way. You take 2nd to 4th century philosophy, 2-4. Then draw a little arrow and put NT for New Testament. And say this is the way they approach the Bible. They look at all of this language like son of God and son of man and the baptism. I wish we had time to deal with them all. Uh, and, and, and man, we could have a blast. But I won't, oh man, I'm trying to move on. But, but I promise you, you don't have to be scared of any verse in the scripture. But what am I going to do with this? So brother? G Jesus says, uh, if, I, if any man believe in me, I am in my, I'm in my father and my father's in me. And, uh, and what are we going to do with all this? I and the father and the father's in me. Well, which person of the Trinity is supposed to be in Jesus? God the son, huh? The second one, not the first one. When Jesus says, it is the father in me. That doth the works. I'm working because my father's in. The son can do nothing of himself. Only all of that language is oneness. Because our Trinitarian friends say the second person, not the first person is in him. What we say is there's only one God and father of all. God the father was in the man Jesus that he became purchasing salvation for us as a man. Only we can make sense of all of the scripture. What are we going to do with the prayers, Brother Kimmel? We're going to look at that in a minute. How many have been asked that question? Was Jesus praying to himself? <laughs> you know, like they got you or something. It's like, well, who do you think he was praying to? I got an answer, but let me go ahead and throw that back on you first. Was, was an omnipotent God the Son praying to an omnipotent God the Father for help? See, the reason you pray is because you need help from a higher power. Now, why is Jesus praying? He's not praying as deity. Hebrews says he offered up prayers in the days of his flesh. His humanity had to submit. I'm going to quote J. Vernon McGee a, a, a through the Bible program, that, that wonderful Trinitarian on the radio. He says if one God prays to another God, he ungods himself. Exactly right. So he's praying as a man, right? Yes. Now, if he's got God on the inside, why does he even need to pray? He would just access what he needed if he was God the Son. But if he's a true man, and every man needs to pray according to Psalms and lift their petition to God, then Jesus as a man had to fulfill that aspect or he could not be our substitute. Oh, I wish we had time. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's trying. So here's what you do. 
you take second to fourth century philosophy where they change biblical terms and invent non-biblical terms. God the Son is never in Scripture. The Son of God is. Well, or, and the Son of Man is. Ooh, that proves he's God the Son. No, 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 no. Go back in the Old Testament and look at all the other examples of, of Son of God and all the sons of man. And what you'll find are their created beings. They're the angels and their humanity. So that means every time you read the term Son of God or Son of Man in the New Testament, you got to let the lens of the Old Testament interpret it. If you go over here and invent God the Son, it's going to mess up Jesus. And if you mess up Jesus and your reading of the Word, you may get your baptism wrong. Okay, turn to your neighbor and say, that's right. I'm trying to hurry. Uh, second and fourth century philosophy, you put an arrow, you put an NT for New Testament, and then and another little arrow put OT, Old Testament. Why? Because over 8,000 times in the Old Testament, God says he's one. I wish we had time to deal, deal with it. 2,436 times Elohim's used of God with singular modifiers. Elohim is the more general term for God, like we use God. But if we want to use his name, we say Jesus, right? So it's the general term for God, Elohim. And, and, and it's like uh, when you see it, they will say, yes, but it's plural. Plural majesty, but not plural number. Because it has a singular modifier. Man, I, all right, I want to help you today. Might as well have a little fun. You got dressed, came to church, might as well have a little fun. So I, I remember I was in seminary, my wonderful PhD uh, uh, feminist professor who was teaching systematic theology, which was interesting. Don't believe much about the Bible, but going to teach systematic theology. What's your authority based in? Not much, except her opinion. That's pretty easy to dismiss. I don't uh, listen. I'm not going to limit my life to what you think. What your best ideas are. I need something higher than that. I need revelation from God. I have revelation from God. I can build my life on something else. I can build my faith on something else. My assurity comes on something else. We have a more sure word of prophecy. It's the vindicated word of God. And I, I, I remember she said, well, you know, if you look at the first verse in the Bible, Elohim is a plural and it's feminine. So in the first verse of the Bible, in, in, in the beginning, God, Elohim, you have an argument for God as a plurality and God is feminine. Now, how many of you want your, how many of you want your faith to be based on the Bible? How many of you would want to know if that's plural and feminine? How many of you want to know that God's a plurality and a bunch of girls? But the problem is, Brother Hawkins Smith, I've already been to IBC. I already know better than that. And, and so I just ups with my hand in the back, causing trouble like I normally do. And, and she said, Bobby. And I said, isn't Elohim quanta plural like deer? And if I say a deer, you know how many deer there are. And the Bible says in the beginning, parach. Uh, that's created, that's a singular modifier for Elohim, Barach Elohim. So it's like saying a deer. So don't we know how many there are? And I said, isn't, isn't the em ending actually masculine? And I kid you not, she turns to her Anglican priest TA who has more language than her, and he says, that's the way we read the Bible now. You mean you've been reading the Bible wrong your whole life? You mean you have shut yourself away from the revelation of the one God of the Old Testament? I wish we had time to deal with all of the examples of the one God of the Old Testament. He's called the Holy One, the Righteous One, the Lovely One, lovely one never the Holy Righteous Two or Three. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the, the Israelite, a Jewish person to this day tries to, with their last breath, make that confession in, in, its con, uh, in, in encapsulated form. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Yahweh. One, that's the name of God. It's not Yerish. You can't, you can't make it substance. God is not just one substance. He's one person. There's only one God. Over 8,000 times God said, I, even I am the Lord. Beside me there is none else. Now which two other persons in the Trinity doesn't know about the other two? I'm going to tell you God by definition is omniscient. He knows all things. There is no Savior beside me. Is there a God beside me? I know not any. I'm going to tell you, you need to just lay aside any tradition and say, God, show me who you are. So here's what you have to do. You have to treat your hermeneutics as sacred. 
What do you mean by that, Brother Kilman? You've got to read the Bible sacredly and seriously. And sometimes showing your friends those kind of approaches, that's your approach. They'd say, well, you're saying you don't have a lens. Oh, no, no, no. I got a lens. I got a lens. Anybody ever put on the wrong prescription? Uh, yeah. Brother Mooney came up to me one time. I should be wearing them for distance. You people in the back, I love you. I don't really see you, but way back in the back. But I, I remember I, got, I need distance. I just hate glasses. It's awful. But I, 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 Brother Mooney would walk over and he'd say, who is that in the back, Brother Kim? Is that the pastor, one of the students from IBC's pastor? And I said, I see ministries walking. I don't know. And so uh, a prescription can clarify if it's the right one prescribed by the doctor. But if it's the wrong one, if you get a prescription that doesn't match you, it clouds, it doesn't clarify. And that's the way people read the Bible. So let me tell you what my lens is. I have an approach. I have an epistemology. I have a commitment prior to me coming to read the Bible. It's called, I believe God's revelation is good. Prove that, Brother Kilman. This is what you would do. Take OT, the Old Testament, draw a little arrow, and put NT. Because see, what they do is they take the Old Testament... And they, they are, I'm sorry, the second to fourth century philosophy. They read that into the New Testament. And then where it says Old Testament, those 8,000 plus references where God is one, X that out. That's the approach of most churches. The, uh, most, mo everybody say wonderful. Say hungry. People that are trapped in tradition. That's the way they've been reading the Bible their whole life. And what you got to do is show them there's a better way, there's a more serious way, there's a more sacred way to read God's revelation because his process of revelation is good. He didn't waste time laying out 75% of revelation. So prove it, Brother Kilman. Okay, we use the Old Testament, arrow over, to read, to understand everything that's said in the New Testament. And then draw an arrow and put 2-4, X that out. Because we don't believe in extra biblical revelation. What does that mean, Brother Kilman? We don't care. Of, we're not looking for anything outside the Bible. Well, Brother Kilman, you quote people. Yeah, only when they agree with this. <laughs> Who are you going to quote? Well, I'll quote. How about I quote Billy Graham's pastor, W.A. Criswell, in an interview with Paige Patterson. He says, what are you going to see when you get to heaven? He said, the only God you're ever going to see in heaven is Jesus. Why are you quoting him, Brother Kilman? Because my Southern Baptist friends have no problem calling me a heretic. They got a serious problem calling Billy Graham's pastor a heretic. Now, why does he say that? Because of John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, he's the one that declares it. The only God you're ever going to see in heaven is Jesus. I, I got to lay in this thing. Matthew 27. Let me give you a case study. Because here's what happens when people read the Bible Wrong. They shut themselves away from the revelation that God intends. The Bible says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. Now, why in the world would the King James translators, they were the most uh, brilliant translators that we've ever had in English. They are. There's a great little book called God's Secretaries. You can trace that down. Please don't believe me. Look it up yourself. They were brilliant. Incredibly. Now, why would they put that that way? Because it's in Greek, but Jesus is quoting Aramaic. And they want you to see that on the cross, he quoted Aramaic. He says, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, you got one or two things happening on the cross. Is this a conversation between God and the Father in terms of the Trinity? He's praying off the table, right? He's praying as a man. But he's also doing something else. Well, maybe, Brother Kilman, the spirit began to pull away and, and, been, and, and Jesus is praying only as a man. No, 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 no. That, that's not happened. Hebrews says that he offered himself up through this, the eternal spirit. What he's doing is he's quoting a passage. If we're in New Testament times and I, we're in synagogue, we're going to meet to uh, read the Bible and pray together. First of all, we wouldn't use that heathen Greek language. We would use either Hebrew or Aramaic. And, and that's how we would worship. We wouldn't speak the Greek language because that was the language of their oppressors. And, and the Hebrew scriptures were in Hebrew. So they would speak either Hebrew or Aramaic. And if I wanted you to open your Bible in the Old Testament, 
to Psalm 22. Now I wish we had time to do the baptism too. I'll give you a little homework for those of you who want a little extra. Just look at Psalm 2, 1, Genesis 22, 2, and, uh, uh, well, uh, we don't have time for that. Isaiah 42, 1. That's an encapsulated thing being spoken to Jesus over his baptism, and it's about him as a man starting his ministry. It has nothing to do with the Trinity. But when you look at Psalm 22, Jesus is quoting. If I wanted you to open up to Psalm 22 in New Testament times, I couldn't say turn to Psalm 22 because the chapters and verses were added into English later. A benefit to us. It was wonderful. So if I wanted you to turn to Psalm 22, I would say open your Hebrew Old Testament to Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabatini, which is Psalm 22, 1. Look at what the Bible says. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, what Jesus is doing is he's doing something on the cross. The suffering is real. But what he's trying to get them to understand, even on the cross, is don't think hell's in charge. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. In the beginning was the word, the plan, the purpose the, in the mind of God. And the word was with God, and the word was God. God was going to be that plan. But you ready? That plan had to be acted out in history. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the the glory of the only begotten, the only born, the only made of the Father, full of grace and truth. How many of you want grace? Then you got to have truth. And the truth is, is the son, the word, the plan is the only way to get there to God. I'll try to land. Jesus, help me. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Look at verses 7 and 8. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. Now remember, this is what's being said about Jesus as he's being crucified. Psalm 22, 14, I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels, right? Go through the side and pierce him in the pericardium, that sac around the heart. The only place you can get water out of the human body. Psalm twenty-two, fifteen: my strength is dried up like a pot shard. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Did, didn't Jesus say, I thirst? For dogs have come past me. What was the Jewish word for Gentiles? The assembly of the wicked has enclosed me, a thief on the right and a thief on the left. They have pierced my hands and feet, crucified. They part my garments, verse 18, among them and cast lots upon my vestures. This is exactly what the soldiers are doing at the feet of Jesus. This is a thousand years before Jesus is born. It was written by a psalmist who had never seen crucifixion in his life because it hadn't been invented yet. It's a prophecy. It's a reflection of Isaiah 51, 52, and 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon a him. It was not upon a them. It was upon a him, that man. It it pleased God to bruise him. Why? He endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? For the joy that was set before him. What joy? He saw you today. He saw me today. He saw a church washed in his blood and purchased and established into this new covenant and new kingdom and new reign with him as our Lord and as a man he would suffer and die but halfway through the psalm it switches from a psalm of suffering to a psalm of victory and I'll I'll land if they'll come up and start playing it'll put music pressure on me to stop but halfway through this psalm It switches from a psalm of suffering to a psalm of victory. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. And in the midst, in verse 22, of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. Notice not them. All ye seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye seed of Israel, who? This suffering servant. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. 
My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows, vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. If you will come meekly and surrender and seek him, he will be your savior. It's like watching the apostles, or the, the disciples, before they become the apostles, before they get filled with the spirit. But they're arguing, Pastor, over who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to be the greatest? I, I want to be on the right. A couple of boys send their mama to say, hey, argue for our position, would you? And mama comes, hey, put one on your right and one on your left. I don't know who wanted to be on the left, but if you read the book of Revelation, you know who wanted to be on the left. They're arguing over position and power. And Jesus walks in and they haven't done the common courtesy. Common courtesy of that day was, you know, wear sandals, dusty streets, dusty roads. They're going to get caked with dirt. Like some California boys would go. We like that. But they got to wash their feet off so they don't track everything around the house. You know whose job that was? Doulos. The Greek word, the lowest servant in the house. Nobody, nobody going to do that. It's not my job to pick up the trash and clean the toilets. Not my job. That's somebody else's job. Jesus girds himself with the towel. Gets down to wash their feet. Peter says, my bad. Not so, Lord. Not so. You can't wash my feet. He says, you call me Lord, and I am. I am. But if you don't let me wash your feet, you can have no part with me. Peter's like, okay. Okay. Not just my feet, my hands, my head, I'm ready. Let's go all in. He said, no, no, it's sufficient. Can I ask you a question? Will you let Jesus be your servant? Will you let him be your suffering servant? Will you say, Lord, if it really was your blood that will wash whiter than snow, if it really is in your name, then I'm willing to lay aside tradition today and say, would you baptize me? Would you wash me? Would somebody take me to the waters and take me down to that only saving bed? Neither is there salvation in any of it. I understand maybe you were born with tradition. I get it. My daddy was born with tradition. He was raised a Church of Christ boy. But he had to divorce himself of tradition so that he could embrace that saving work of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you today. Why would you walk out of here? If he died so that you could live, why wouldn't you want to be baptized in his name today? Why wouldn't you say, Lord, if I have to give up these traditions and read the Bible correctly so that I can enter into the kingdom, I want to do it. I'm closing. Would you stand with me? Here's what I want you to do. I got, I got two altar calls. The first one is for you saints. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be able to do this in your brain at some point. You should commit this to memory. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. Because when you go to Acts chapter 2, what you'll find is what baptism uh, is embraced in the New Testament. Acts 2, 38. There was a guy in Grand Rapids. I don't have time to tell the whole story. We walked into Grand, uh, uh, a motel. We were there taking the IBC uh, students, some of them, about 50 of them on a trip uh, to go to Baker Bookhouse. And, and he said, so what flavor are you? What, you're here with the Bible college. What flavor are you? I said, well, we're, uh, I didn't even say apostolic yet. I said, we're Pentecostal. He said, uh, is that like uh, Catholic? I'm like, eh, not so much. And I didn't even say apostolic yet. He had never been around anything other than his own Reformed background. And I, I said to him, I, I, he said, but you believe in the Trinity, right? Now, you have to figure out what you're going to say in a moment like that. And, and you can't be mean, and it's not about winning. But just very gently, I shared the truth. I said, no, we wouldn't believe in anything necessarily that the Bible doesn't teach. So, of course, we wouldn't believe in the Trinity. And he goes, oh. I said, well, you know, uh, Matthew 28, 19. Go make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I said, uh, what is the name of the Son of God? Ask that question first. I don't care if they're a PhD or if it's a person on the street. Everyone will answer the same way. 
Jesus. That's right. Matthew 1, 21. You shall have a son, title, and call his name Jesus. Now what he doesn't know is it's over. Because if son's not a name in Matthew 28, 19, then what is that singular name? Baptizing them in the name, not names. Jesus says in John 14, I am come in my Father's name. He says, I'm going to send back the comforter in my name. There's only one saving name. And I said, so, of course, we, we would baptize in Jesus' name. We wouldn't believe in the Trinity. And, and I'm walking up to my room, and I'm trying to go to bed that night, and, and he's coming out, and he's got a Gideon in his hand. Brother Mooney said, get, get sleep. I don't, I don't want you guys all looking blurry-eyed. He knows college students. They'll stay up to ungodly hours. Hallelujah. I don't know how they live getting that amount of sleep. But he's walking out the door, coming back down. He has a, he has a Gideon in his hand. And he said, oh, are you going to bed? I said, yeah, we've got an early day. I'm going to get some shut-eye. He said, well, I was hoping we could talk some more. And I said, uh, you know, inside of my... You know, but I'm trying to keep calm. Oh, sure, I mean, if you really want to. You know. So we go downstairs. He said, well, well, you're questioning my baptism. Now, what are you going to say in a moment like that? I just said, uh, oh, no, sir. I'm not questioning your baptism. Now, if the Bible's doing that, that's something else. But I'm not questioning your baptism. I have no authority to validate or question any baptism. The only validation is in that book that he gave us. And, and you can probably do this already, but I just said, open your Bible. You know, the Bible that they've prayed over. The Bible that they've wept. Can you get a vision of the harvest that God wants to give you? Brother, pa my pastor, Brother Carson, I have to be careful how I say this, but he's already baptized two Southern Baptist pastors, in G or two Baptist pastors in uh, Jesus' name this year. You don't know what God may be trying to do to bring revival to this city. And I said, open up to Acts 2. What does it say? Verse 38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, go to Acts chapter 8. What does it say? Oh, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Okay, what do you go to Acts 10? Start about verse 44. And then, uh, you know, and there they are. And, and then the Gentiles are brought in. They're baptized in Jesus' name. And then before I can even say it, he says, but that doesn't say rebaptism. And in my head, I was like, God, you've got this guy's number. I said, go to Acts 19. You got some of John's disciples. They're going through the upper coast. And, and they bump into the Apostle Paul. And he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now remember, many traditions, many churches in this town will tell you, when you believe, you receive the Spirit. Not according to Paul. Not according to the Bible. They're like, we don't even know what you're talking about. What do you mean, Holy Ghost? He says, he goes, okay. He said, I'll tell you how it is. Uh, and how are you baptized? Because if you don't have the Holy Ghost, maybe something's wrong with your baptism. According to John's baptism, and they took, take him out, and they baptize him in Jesus' name. And I'm watching this older man. I was much younger then, but he just begins to tremble as he's reading his Bible. He says, I just don't know if I believe this. I said, well, listen, my agenda is not to try to find some fountain to dunk you in Jesus' name right now. I, I, I want you to make a step. Now, if you want to be baptized in Jesus' name, I'm ready. I, I'd love to baptize you in Jesus' name. But it's more important for you to say, what does the Bible say? And what do I need to do? So here's what I, I'm telling you, saints. There are going to be people that the Lord puts in your path. And you've got to be willing to kindly, you've got to equip yourself and then share the truth in love. And don't be afraid to confront tradition. So what are you saying? Am I lost? I can't say anything about your destination or your salvation. What we have to do is say, why wouldn't we obey the Lord and go by His standard? Would you slip a hand up and just say, I, I, I dare you to pray this prayer. Lord, send me to someone. I'm going to spend this whole next week looking around on my job and thinking about my family and I'm going to make a phone call or I'm going to try to slip something in a conversation to get somebody to this great saving name so that you can give them what only you can give. Do you hunger after the all of righteousness? How about, how about hungering after winning souls? How about hungering after people that are, yes, lost and destituted in terrible situations, but how about just good people trapped in the lies of tradition? 
And if you're saying, Brother Kilman, I don't know about this. I hear what you're saying. And I want to, I promise you, if you come to pastor, somebody would love to give you a Bible study so that you can understand.